I'm Spencer Mazik, and joining me now is lawyer turned award winning composer and pianist Derek Wang. He is the composer of a new opera called Scalia Ginsburg that dramatizes the justice's battles over constitutional interpretation. Welcome, Derek. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Spencer. Thanks for having me. Derek, I should actually introduce you as composer turned lawyer turned composer since you began at teaching yourself how to compose music at the age of four. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. I was uh, playing the piano, and actually, that's how I started. I, I started teaching myself to play piano as a little tyke. Um, I didn't quite believe it until my parents sat me down and made me watch some videographic evidence, and I was like, oh, there I am in preschool playing the piano. Well, my brother started taking lessons, and, uh, and I imitated him, as younger brothers often do. And uh, at some point, my family had some visitors coming uh, at the house, and they said, wow, the lessons are going really well. And my parents said, well, he's not taking any lessons. And so <laughs> after that, they decided, oh, maybe, you know, maybe it's something, something he should try. And so eventually, I started taking piano lessons. And the teacher said, you know, do you think he's too young? Maybe wait a little bit. And my folks said, you know, let's just see what happens. And it turned out to be a great thing. And for me, I guess the way I'm built, I love to know how things work. I love to sort of dig into dig into the details of things and figure out how these things function. And so when I was playing the piano, I always thought, well, how does this piece work? How is it constructed? How is it made? And so every time I would learn to play something, I would try to write a piece myself. And that's how I started to teach myself to compose. And eventually, you know, the pieces got bigger and or longer or what have you, and here we are. Well, and so you later went on to college, to Harvard University, where you majored in music, no surprise there. But uh, at that point in your life, what were your future plans, Derek? Wow. OK, so I'm going to have to think back a bit. <laughs> yes, yes, if you myself. could, just think back a little bit, please. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, I knew, that, I knew that I loved music, and I knew that I wanted to major in it, which was great because uh, coming into college, it helped. I was able to take some placement, ex uh, placement exams, excuse me, and uh, pass out of certain of the uh, introductory courses. So I was able to start in a lot of the sophomore classes as a freshman. And that was tremendously uh, helpful to me because it gave me a chance again to dive right in and uh, dig into a lot of the material that we were studying. Um, as far as what I thought I would do as I try to place myself back in 18-year-old Derek's head, I think. But did you well, see? Was, did you see a career path? I guess that's what I'm wondering. Whether or not you went to college thinking, okay, well, I'm majoring in music, so now I want to do this with it. Oh right. Well, as a lot of my mentors and a lot, of, as a lot of seasoned uh, artists will say, you know, there isn't necessarily a career path. There's not necessarily a fixed track. So I think for me, college was definitely a time of exploration. I was very interested in pursuing music, um, and I wanted to see where it would take me. Um, but I, you know, there wasn't sort of the some traditional path where you would, you know, do your degree and then go spend X number of years somewhere and then do something else and then sort of rise through the ranks. It was just a matter of a matter of being open to the opportunities around me, to developing uh, myself as an artist, to developing, I think, perspective and empathy, which I think are two things every artist needs to have. Um, that having been said, uh, when I was finishing college, I was applying to graduate schools. And certainly, that was a great way for me to further develop myself as an artist. And so things turned out, uh, things, things turned out very well in that respect. I was lucky enough to be accepted to um, the Yale to School master's of, programs. Right, you went to the right. Yale it School was, of Music and then also the Peabody correct. Institute at Johns Hopkins University as a way to really further your musical career or education. Right, I so actually, say. yeah. So actually, uh, Peabody, um, that, was, that was before college, actually. I had done, I had done the pre-college program there, and it was a wonderful, a wonderful grounding in piano and theory. And I had gotten my certificate there. And then for graduate study, I did go to Yale. It was, I was in a very fortunate position. Um, it had come down to uh, Cambridge, the master's program there, uh, Juilliard, the master's program there, um, the theater uh, program at Tisch at NYU and Yale. And in the end, um, Yale seemed to be the right choice for me. 
and uh, I went there, and it was it was a very rewarding experience. So, Derek, let me ask you this because it seems like everything about you, your core, you know, everything about you is about music. I can see that it's very obvious to me. So, why did you then decide to go to law school? That's a fair question. Uh, basically, well, as I was saying, perspective and empathy are these two core tenets, I think, of what it means to be an artist. And all my life I've had this drive to seek out new challenges and to expand my horizons. And for example, when I was a music student, I think a lot of composition students uh, try to, as they believe is you know, the, the sort of done thing, is to spend their summers, for example, uh, going to music festivals and taking composition lessons and furthering themselves in that way. And for me, it was very interesting um, to me instead to choose to pursue arts management and to work uh, backstage, as it were, or in the office or behind the scenes at arts organizations and to figure out how that worked. What arts management taught me as a creative artist was how to understand the needs of this greater community um, that was helping art to be created. And so it was an unconventional choice, but it was worth it. And similarly, in the same way that arts managers provide the practical environment in which art can flourish, um, intellectual property law provides that legal environment in which our art is made and enjoyed. And so it was very interesting to me as well, very fascinating to understand how intellectual property worked. And I figured the best way to do that was to study it. And I was very fortunate to receive a scholarship to law school, which allowed me to really delve into these issues and to learn a lot about them. And I think I'm a much better artist for it. That's fascinating to me. That, so you basically went to law school because you had this interest in intellectual property law and you wanted to learn more about it. Is that right? That's correct. Well, and so at the Maryland School of Law, you actually came up with the idea for an opera about the justices Scalia and Ginsburg. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Well, there I was, a student at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law, and I was studying constitutional law, as one does. You know, you're given these cases, these historic and important Supreme Court cases, and you read them. And so there I was, reading case after case after Supreme Court case. You know, it's a pretty routine first-year assignment. And I was reading and reading and reading, and suddenly the three magic words jumped out at me. Scalia, J, dissenting. And I read the dissent that followed that, and I thought, this is the most dramatic thing I've ever read in law school. And so I read another and another and another, and there was just this passion and this fire in these very articulate words that made me think, this is, this is like a rage aria about the Constitution. And so I started to hear music. And then, in contrast to a lot of Justice Scalia's dissents, I came upon Justice Ginsburg's opinions as well. And she uh, had her own way of writing, um, a lyrical style with a strength all of its own. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of drama here. And this, to me, could be a great opera. Wow, so you heard music while reading The Descent and The Opinions, and that actually was the inspiration for this particular opera, which you also described as being dramatic. Yes, well, um, if you, I mean, if you read the words of Justices Scalia and Ginsburg, there's plenty of drama to go around. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, and, and the words themselves are brilliantly written, um, very articulately done, very well thought out. It's just such a rich resource and such a dramatic one, again, that it was just so attractive. You know, I couldn't resist. I, I said, all right, I have to write this opera. Did, but did you have any trepidation, though, at all in, in trying to do this? Did you think, oh, no, these are such uh, powerful political figures here. Um, maybe I might not need to do this. Were there any concerns well, like that? Well, the way I saw it was the opinions themselves of the justices, which inspired the opera, those are great works in and of themselves. So regardless of what I do, I'm pretty sure those opinions are going to be just fine. <laughs> and as far as I was concerned, um, my constitutional law professor, Robert Percival, put me in touch with his colleague, Mike Walker, who's an accomplished attorney uh, at the EPA, also a great lover of opera, and in fact headed the Washington National Opera's supernumerary guild. And Mike Walker became a great supporter of this project. And we submitted some material to Justices Ginsburg and Scalia, you mm. know, saying, you know, what do you think? <laughs> and the response we got was, was very encouraging. 
And eventually, uh, we were extended this invitation to come present at the Supreme Court. So yeah. needless to say, that was a great honor. I, yeah, I heard that you actually previewed work, your work before the two justices in June at the end of the term. So what were their reactions? How did they respond? Oh, the reaction was very warm, very encouraging. Um, they, they were very attentive, I think. I had, of course, provided them with the texts as well, the, uh, the texts I had written that were inspired by and based on certain of their statements and which they read you know, very carefully. And, uh, and to be fair, I had also footnoted them, you know, blue booked the whole thing, so <laughs> all, everything course, that they were course. reading. So, you know, so, so that, gives one, that gives you a sense of security. And, uh, and the reaction, I think the reaction was very positive. I think they enjoyed it. I think they understood what I was getting at. And of course, they know their words better than anyone else. And they, of course, as lovers of opera, and as great friends themselves, I think they appreciated a lot of the references to opera and the great operatic tradition in Scalia Ginsburg, the opera, as well as the emphasis on how these two people who differ on so many issues can overcome their differences and, uh, and be friends. And so I think that's a, that's a lesson to all of us. Because if the two of them can get along, there's no excuse for the rest of us. Yes, we all should be able to get along just, as sa just the same. Derek, I have to ask you, though, were you at least, was it a little nerve-wracking to perform an opera about the justices in front of them? Well, I was certainly aware of my surroundings. <laughs> um, I mean, you get invited to, to the East Conference Room of the Supreme Court, and you go through this bronze gate, which you know, generally doesn't open, and you suddenly go through, and there you are in this richly carpeted room with the paintings of chief justices on the walls, and the sunlight streaming down, and the grand piano in the corner, and you think, wow, this is where Barbara Cook sang last month, and where Renee Fleming sang not too long ago. And so you think, huh. And I, as I told my singers, well, number one, congratulations, and number two, no pressure. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but it was it was a joy to perform for them. It was really a, a joy to present uh, some of this material for them, and and I just had a great time doing it. Yeah, it sounds like it would be a complete honor. And just tell me though, have you completed the uh, work yet, the piece yet, or are you still working on Scalia Ginsburg? I am still working on Scalia Ginsburg. Actually, the opportunity to present for them and to meet with them has given me greater insight into their characters, and I'm incorporating that as well. And certainly, uh, there, are, there are, of course, recent, um, very well-written decisions, um, very articulate decisions from the both, both of them with, uh, with some great quotations. So certainly, I think some of that may be finding its way into the opera pretty soon as well. That's great. And when do you expect to complete the, the opera? I would, say, uh, I would say fairly soon. Um, okay. There's been some interest from a number of organizations. For example, the Washington National Opera's Young Artists Program. So as far as that's concerned, we're exploring the possibilities there. And certainly, um, my work on it is, is continuing, is sort of hurtling toward, toward completion, as it were. Well, and you've just completed, talking about completions, you just finished law school in May. You also just took the Maryland bar exam. Congratulations on that, Derek. So well, thank you. So what are your immediate plans? What are your next steps for the future? I mean, do you intend well, on my, practicing law? That's actually my big question. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, my immediate plans are to continue working on this opera, this, you know, this wonderful opportunity. Um, and then after that, I intend to continue creating. I think law school has given me this great opportunity to really dig into, to study, and to research, and to um, gain a better understanding of intellectual property law. And I think that has contributed, in fact, uh, to the progress of Scalia Ginsburg, the opera. Obviously, knowing constitutional law helps a lot when you're trying to write a libretto <laughs> about uh, two Supreme Court justices, but also just the skills that I learned there. Again, I feel it's about perspective and empathy. When you're in law school, you're trained to look at a situation from all perspectives and to be able to analyze and to appreciate an issue from all sides gives you that sense of empathy. It gives you that sense of understanding for each of the different parties. And that's great for a dramatic writer because ideally, as a dramatic writer, you're writing a piece for performance that's about multiple conflicting characters that represents them uh, in a genuine and moving way. 
And so I think in that sense, uh, my experience studying the law has been, has been very helpful in that regard and is helping me make the most of my music. Well, and Derek, you've chosen a very expensive path, though, to continue your pursuit of music. So would you say, but for the scholarship that you received to go to law school, would you have gone to law school? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, it, it, I guess it takes place in an alternate reality, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have to hypothesize about that for a moment. I'll, I will say that uh, the scholarship I received uh, for law school, as well as the scholarship I received for graduate school, uh, were great boons to me. They, they gave me flexibility um, in terms of determining what I wanted to do. They gave me that freedom to really explore my passions and to pursue them, and in this case, you know, with some very encouraging results. And for that, I'm very grateful to the institutions that, uh, and to the, to the donors and the sponsors that have been helping me along the way. So in five or 10 years from now, you're still not practicing law, but we can expect great music from you. Isn't that right? I certainly hope so. I will, I will do my best, and I hope to see you in the audience. I certainly will be there. Derek, thanks so much for joining us today to talk about your unique journey. <laughs> we appreciate it. Terrific. It was a pleasure to speak with you as well. Thanks for having me. For more information on this or other topics, subscribe to BloombergLaw.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody.